How do we bolster our brain's capacity? We all are born with a beautiful mind. And then we go through childhood, we go through adolescence, we get into adulthood, and then we bombard our mind with electronics, with sometimes maybe useless information, or maybe information that's not as useful to us. Maybe we get bombarded with choices. I know a lot of, uh, a lot of my tiredness and exhaustion comes from having too many choices sometimes. How do we really get our brain humming in the most optimal way that we can? How do we have a peak mind, whether that's through mindfulness practices, maybe it's meditation, whether it's through diet and nutrition? How do we really make sure that our brain is functioning to its full capacity? That's what we're going to be talking about in today's episode. And to help you understand your brain and how you can exercise the brain, I brought in a new friend of mine, a fellow by the name of Michael Trainer. He is the founder of a company called Peak Mind, which launched with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So we're going to find a little bit about that. Uh, find out a little bit about Peak Mind today. He's also the co-creator of a festival called the Global Citizen Festival, which hosts about 70,000 people on the Great Lawn in Central Park annually. And Michael has a lot of experience with uh, bolstering the brain and, and brain functionality. His father um, actually had dementia, and we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, today. So if you're wanting to improve your brain functionality, listen up, because we're going to go through it. With that, it's a big welcome to Michael Trainer. How are you, Michael? Good, James. How are you? I'm very well, mate. Good to have you here. Uh, tell us a Good little here. bit. Tell us a little bit about your story and your interest and passion in things to do with the brain's capacity. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, second of all, my my interest in the brain really was uh, was was catapulted when my father was diagnosed with dementia. So. As you mentioned at the time, I was uh, I was working with an, an incredible team to build something called the Global Citizen Festival, which was a concert and a movement to end extreme poverty. Um, it's still going very strong with incredible guests uh, every year and uh, being leveraged to raise uh, significant contributions on behalf of the world's poor. Uh, but when my father was diagnosed with dementia, I made the very hard choice to uh, step away and focus on supporting him. And so it's been, a, it's been an incredible three-year journey, uh, but it started off first with, with meditation, and that, that had been a long-standing interest. I, I lived actually with a traditional uh, healer on a Fulbright scholarship in Sri Lanka when I was, when I was 19 and started uh, Vipassana meditation then. But uh, Harvard came out with a study um, several years back, which actually demonstrated the ability for mindfulness and meditation to enhance neuroplasticity. And so that led me on a deep dive uh, into meditation and the desire to popularize meditation, because uh, which actually is obviously happening at the moment, especially within some of our circles. But but really, how can we have a, a mind and a vision towards seeing meditation become common practice uh, in communities all around the world? And so at that point in time, uh, I had a vision which included uh, in, uh, utilizing some of the leading meditators I knew and no one in my mind uh, was the embodiment of that more than His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And we decided to host an event around his 80th birthday to bring about greater awareness around the virtues of meditation. And he, he very gracefully um, offered to come and share some of his teachings. So my, my interest in the brain really was uh, catalyzed by my father's diagnosis. And since then, I've been uh, delving deeply into sort of the nutritional lifestyle aspects that can enhance uh, cognitive ability and neurogenesis. And your father was diagnosed with dementia a few years ago, Michael, is that right? Three years ago? Yeah, that's right. So he was diagnosed about three years ago uh, while I was uh, working in building um, uh, global citizen with the team. He actually had been diagnosed with cancer. Uh, fortunately that is uh, knock on wood in remission, but uh, about after he kind of, 
had done two years of chemotherapy, um, it was discovered that he had dementia. Now, dementia actually onsets in the brain uh, decades before the first symptoms. So his diagnosis came about three years ago, but it's likely that the onset was far earlier. Just for the uninitiated, can you just explain uh, dementia, um, what it is uh, and how it shows up in people? Yeah, for sure. So, so the most common form of dementia that, that I think is, is most familiar to people is Alzheimer's, which right now in the United States alone, there's over 5 million people with Alzheimer's. But there are a myriad of different uh, dementias, if you will. Uh, my father has uh, frontal lobe dementia. Um, all of them are basically are diseases of the brain that cause cognitive impairment and slowly drain uh, people of their memories and ultimately their identities. It's, it's an extraordinarily painful disease, not only for the person who has dementia, which often leads to confusion, um, but also for the families that, that love them because your, your, your identity, obviously, the one organ we can't replace in our body is our brain. And mm. our entire identity and the way that we filter through the world is, is all processed through our brain. So it's the center for our identity. So if you can think of, in many ways, the most dreaded thing you can think of, um, oftentimes it would be the loss of that identity slowly over time, knowing at least it was thought that the, that the brain was you know, m many people have this idea that the brain, once, once you're, you're born with kind of a perfect brain and it slowly degrades over time and there's no nothing you can do about it. Uh, what's been beautiful though in, in this search is that actually the leading kind of doctors in the functional medicine field are saying that actually you can enhance your neuroplasticity. In other words, your ability to bolster against dementias throughout your life. And actually, uh, the earlier you start, the better. So... <clears throat> Basically, what I'm trying to do is just to raise awareness around the fact that our brains are extraordinarily sensitive. Uh, we are, as you mentioned at the, at the top end of the show, uh, encountering an increasing amount of, of toxins in our environment as well as our food supply and different, um, different things which actually, depending on your diet and lifestyle, can degrade your brain. But there is a diet and lifestyle uh, that can actually enhance your cognitive abilities. And so in, in working to really serve my father and be of service to, to others as I share this message, I've been, you know, I'm not a doctor myself. Let me just qualify that. You know, if, you, if, you're, going to, if you're going to seek medical treatment, um, I can recommend some wonderful doctors. Dr. Mark Hyman, uh, David Perlmutter is an incredible doctor. But, but having spent time with them and done deep research, um, these are some of the findings I've come across, and it's actually very exciting because, on the flip side, the positive <laughs> is that we can actually have very uh, we can have we can have life enhancing effects on the brain throughout our lives, and it's not a it's not a fatal calling card call, excuse me calling card as we once thought it was. Mm. There's actually ways in which we can uh, encourage neuroplasticity throughout our lives. Mm. So just before we get into a few things, like well, I'll get you to talk about, you know, what we're doing daily that's degrading our brain. And then we'll talk about some ways in which we can strengthen the brain. But just um, going back to your father, I mean, it must be, it must have been, and it must con continuously be, uh, you know, a great source of frustration or, or pain for you to have to, to, to go through that process with your father. Like for the listener who's, who, who, um, maybe isn't just aware of the level of care that maybe you have have to to give to a loved one. Could you just clarify like some of those things and what your personal feelings are around um, around your father and, and his dementia, or maybe even things that he shared with you about his dementia? I think that would really help us get an insight into you know what the, the I guess the patient and the loved ones of the patient you know experience. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. Um, so my dad, by way of context, is, is one of the most uh, loving, gracious humans you could ever meet. Um, he's the kind of guy where if I said, Dad, could you, you, know, could you pick up my friend James from the airport at 2 in the morning on, uh, you know, in the middle of the night, he wouldn't even ask who James is. He'd just be there at 2 in the morning. You know, wow. he's, he's, that, he's that kind of a guy. Yeah. Uh, if it's important to me, it's important to him. I mean, he didn't miss, he didn't miss a game uh, growing up. He... he um, I'm just painting a little bit of a picture so you can appreciate. I mean, his his own father actually was never he came from a very stoic background. was a was a military uh, a general uh, a uh, captain in the military. Never once actually told my father that uh, he loved him. 
because it wasn't uh, within his it wasn't within his capacity. Uh, but my father, when he when he revealed himself fully to his dad to to declare his love, the only way he knew that his dad uh, that it meant something to him was he took a napkin from the table and he folded it and he put it in his pocket. And so um, he grew. My dad grew up basically long and short of it. Um, you know, loved, but 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 he the degree to which he exemplifies love is truly profound for me. So to give you context, the challenge is that this this human who has been there, who's had my back who has been uh, a source of perpetual support, I now have to watch uh, slowly fade away. Um, mm. So it's, it's you know, I, I try to always keep in context the positives, right? So the positives are some people, unfortunately, never get to say goodbye to their, their loved one. Mm. And if there's, if there's one thing that comes out of this podcast, uh, I hope it's that, you know, your listeners will take a moment to, to, to write a letter to say the things that haven't been said to those they love the most. There's actually a, a study out of um, out of Stanford Medical School, um, which you can research uh, or potentially link up in the show notes, where they say there's four questions or four things really that you need to say to a loved one, um, and it's written by a doctor who f- focuses on palliative end of life care, and he said, um, "Thank you, I love you, forgive me, I forgive you," and so uh, I highly recommend uh, writing it writing a letter, sitting down with your loved ones. Um, Because what I've discovered, the essence of your question is, you know, the people that we come to love, they're still there in their essence. You know, my dad, I know, I know he loves me. I know that I know that he, the degree of our connection is, is profound. Yet at the same time, you know, a year ago at our farmhouse, he forgot my name for the first time. You know, mm-hmm. at times he doesn't know who my mother is at times he doesn't know who I am you know so if you can imagine the person the person that you love most in the world mm-hmm. starts to slowly lose their sense of who you are you start to have a sense of the psychological effects and that's not even taking into consideration um, you know the stress it puts on the family who, who you know who's going to take care of whom uh, the financial consequences you know End of life care causes more bankruptcies in the United States of America than than anything else, wow. um, and so you know our healthcare system is a whole another uh, point of conversation. But but you know you're you're looking at uh, there's no good answer, right? How do you care and, and demonstrate the love for the, those who you love the most when sort of the best case scenario is is a, a scenario you you wouldn't wish for, right? You know mm. how, how do you put someone in in a, in a potentially in a nursing home in a hospital bed where they're where they're you know, um, where they're left to decline. Fortunately, my mother and father are still together. They've been married 47 years and my dad's still, uh, in her care in the, in the home that, that we've been, you know, uh, born and raised in, which is really amazing. Uh, but, um, I'm now confronting, you know, uh, this week alone, talking about things like power of attorney, power of health. How do you make those, the hardest of decisions with those you love the most? These, these are the, these are the consequences of, of, uh, of a disease which impacts not just the 5 million people in the United States, but, but all of the family members that are left to care for them. And the, and the, and the consequence, I mean, it, it, it can derail a caregiver's life, right? It becomes their full focus. So it's really, truly profound. And, and it takes us a little bit just for a moment away from me personally, you know, they're now calling dementia type three diabetes. Uh, really? Yeah. So, if you look at the epidemic of type two diabetes, which is now um, which is now very present, the likelihood of getting dementia if you have type two th- uh, diabetes, diabetes is exponentially more more likely. And if you look at the research, and I've, I've done this, it's it's insane. I mean, I, I used to focus on uh, trying to t- trying to bring about um, support for diseases affecting the extreme poor, like polio and malaria. And then I did the then I did the research and realized that actually dementia and diabetes are going to be a global pandemic. I mean, if you look right now, there's about 11% of both the population in China as well as the United States that have uh, that have dementias. Mm. Uh, excuse me, that have diabetes. For me, mm. but if if you look at pre diabetes, uh, pre diabetes, right now, 50% 50% of the Chinese population alone. That's not taking into consideration India, Mexico, countries around the world that have adopted a Western lifestyle are dealing with the toxicities. Which are which are now in our environment. That's so you're talking about 500 million people, which, if their lifestyle continues, are are more likely to have the onset of type two diabetes. Which means, 
that we could be facing a, a very significant crisis, both in, in the form of diet and life, which is diet and lifestyle born, right? Well around the world, right? So that we're talking about something that could affect hundreds of millions of people. First of all, I, w I want to thank you for giving us a glimpse into your life and the, li and the life of your family as well. I know that, um, um, you know, it sounds challenging. It sounds really challenging. I really appreciate you, you, you know, like I said, giving us a glimpse into that. I think that the emotional side of that will certainly makes me, you know, feel a great level of um, um, support for you, you know, and then it helps me to understand what it is that we're facing here and what, and what, and the road that we might be headed down. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I, I want to ask you this question. Um, is your, your father's dementia now with all the research that you have done, do you feel like it was something that he was just naturally born to have naturally born to be afflicted with? Or do you think that it is a, that it, it is a direct result of his diet and his lifestyle um, up until this point? Uh, yeah. Wonderful. I mean, it's, it, that is one of the big questions, right? So um, what I will say is the science shows that there are genetic predispositions that make one more likely to have the onset of certain dementias and Alzheimer's and, th and those biomarkers, you can actually get tests and I encourage that and I'm um, happy to share some, some great resources. Uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen actually is, uh, is an incredible researcher and has actually reversed Alzheimer's in, uh, in a small clinical study. Got, uh, incredible. Uh, but to your core question, yes, there are genetic predispositions and factors which uh, uh, make it more likely that you can have uh, neurodegenerative disease. However, those genetic uh, predispositions are not a uh, are not definitive. One and two, uh, if caught early enough, with with which has been seen, and we're we're at the we're, this is the frontier of brain science. I mean, it's it's incredible. I mean, if you look at David Perlmutter's research, he's actually literally taken two, uh, or I don't know if he personally, but he quotes in his book, um, Grain Brain, which I highly recommend, um, and Brain Maker. He talks about two twins who are, who are genetically basically identical, one profoundly unhealthy and the other, uh, the other healthy. And this may not be the most palatable, but one of the of leading sciences now in terms of uh, interventions is, is fecal implant. So, you know, our microbiome, our gut health, and the, and the, uh, the bacteria, the flora, are, are intricately linked to our brain health. Um, in terms of production of neurotransmitters like serotonin even, right? Like which, which, which enhances our, our happiness. So, mm. the, the, so, I mean, the, the cascade down is, is, is significant. You want to talk about depression, all different kinds of uh, neurological factors. But to the essence of your question, what we're, what, what, we're, what we're seeing is that your diet and lifestyle can have profound implications on whether or not uh, any, any – pre-existing biological markers actually lead to disease. So what I would say is that, and aside from that, even if you have what, what I would argue, and again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not speaking as a doctor, but based on my research, if you, if you, um, if you have, you know, no uh, markers necessarily for uh, Alzheimer's, that doesn't mean you, you won't get dementia if you eat an entirely, uh, pardon me, crappy diet and, and live, you know, if you have acute stress, if, you have, if you're eating tons of processed foods, if you're in an environmentally toxic place, that lifestyle basically causes inflammation. And that chronic inflammation can have a myriad of effects, you know, including autoimmune diseases, but also dementias, right? So basically, what, what, in the context of the brain, when you, when, you, when you eat and have a certain lifestyle that enhances inflammation in the brain, the challenge is your brain doesn't have pain receptors, right? So with the exception of maybe something analogous to a hangover, when, when you've drank too much alcohol and the next day, you, you can tell the effects in an acute sense. When you're, when you're, generally speaking, when you're eating, you know, grains, when you're eating breads, carbs, you know, we know that that makes us feel better oftentimes, like it's a comfort food, like in my past, I, I loved, I loved pizza, you know, now I try to limit my consumption, but, but basically, you know, if we, if we have chronic inflammation throughout our lives, that has effects on our brain. So to answer your question, 
uh, you know, specifically, there are genetic markers, but, but, but also it's, it's uh, my friend James Mask, who runs a functional forum, said it this way. It, it, even if you have a loaded gun, it doesn't mean that you have to pull the trigger, right? So even if you have all the genetic uh, markers, if you, if you, there are people who have had um, miraculous turnarounds in theoretically, you know, inoperable or, you know, theoretically, you know, impossible to cure diseases. I'll give an example. I was with last week, um, a woman uh, who had progressive MS, uh, Dr. Terry Walls. Now, she basically create, came up with a protocol and is now working to clinically prove that it works beyond herself. But in the context of her own personal health, and you can Google her TED Talk, it's amazing. She went from progressive MS. In other words, she was bound to a wheelchair with a degenerative disease that's theoretically incurable. She went into an aggressive protocol, which in, includes a, a, a dramatically revised, you know, diet and lifestyle. She went, she went ostensibly uh, to a almost like a, a primal, primalific diet, and and ate almost all, you know, fruits, vegetables, greens, some meats, some liver meats. Uh, you can look up the protocol. I won't go into all the details here. And she, one year later, was walking. Two years later, was riding a horse. And I was with her last week, and she, you couldn't tell she had any any symptoms whatsoever. So, so it's, it's actually, what I, when I look at someone like my father, I feel like it's, it's kind of the canary in the coal mine, if I, can, if, I kind of, if I remove myself, in terms of saying that we're, we're right now besieged by, by, a, by a type of environment and, and a whole deluge of forces that are encouraging us to eat lots of sugar. It's very hard to actually take on a diet which, which is actually ideal for your brain based on what you can buy in, in everyday supermarkets. So, um, so there are there are ways you can approach it, and and there's systems that you can, and, and doctors okay. that are amazing. Uh, I'm happy to go into, but in, okay. essence, in essence, to your question, um, it's not a death sentence. Okay, so let's do this now, Michael. We're talking to uh, Michael Trainer, um, who uh, is the founder of Peak Mind, which launched with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Um, so. Let's do five things that we're doing in our everyday life that we know definitively is degrading our brains. So what are the, what are the, the standard things that you see people doing that is degrading our brain and increasing our chances of getting type 3 diabetes or getting dementia later on in life? Well, there's a few things, and I'll hopefully I'll turn this around with things that you can do to to, to also um, you know step up your chances for resilience. But um, you know, one thing is, and actually I'll, I'll start I'll start with you know some of the broader based lifestyle tenants. So we'll start broad. But I know a lot of your work, James. You like to focus on sleep. Mm -hmm. So sleep is actually pivotal, and quality sleep is pivotal because you know, when you're sleeping, it's actually the time in which your, your brain ostensibly takes out the trash, right? So, so having a deep quality REM sleep, which, you know, I can go into detail, but I know this is your specialty, so I, I probably won't in this instance, but, 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 but turning your bedroom into a sleep sanctuary and getting deep quality rest is, is, is hugely influential. So, so the, the, the epidemic of, and, and by the way, I'm all for hustling and creating big results, but the epidemic of crush it at all expenses, all nighters, you know, a lot of, a lot of what is encouraged in our entrepreneurial culture. And I, I'm an entrepreneur, um, is antithetical to brain health. That doesn't mean you can't hustle and crush it, but it does mean you should be smart about the foundations you're laying to do so. So one, one would be sleep. Another would be uh, diet. So, our diets right now are unfortunately uh, full of processed foods um, uh, for those you know, really basic, you know, processed, processed foods are, are generally speaking things that you'll find in a, in a box, you know, that have been, that are, they're not the way sort of, they're not closest to their natural source. Right. So generally speaking in a supermarket, the outer aisles oftentimes are like the produce, vegetables, et cetera. Um, you know, eating. So another thing that's having an, uh, an effect um, is based on the, the Institute for Functional Medicine conference I was just at is pesticides. So pesticides are unfortunately being sprayed uh, most significantly on conventional produce, but pesticides are now being genetically embedded into into many different kinds of products, right? So you have an almost, uh, you know, you have a, a widespread use of things like um, 
glyphosate, which otherwise known as Roundup, uh, which it, which is a which is a pesticide. Um, these these kinds of things, uh, you know. I, I, let's just say ideally you're, you're focusing on organic, uh, or, organic, uh, fruits and vegetables and free range. If you, if you do eat meat, free range meats, so as to avoid, um, exposure to environmental, um, toxins like pesticides. Um, the other thing is environment, right? So, um, one of the things, and, and, and I'll, and I'll add to that more broadly stress, right? So cortisol levels, being in a state of acute stress decreases your immunity, you know? So, so the degree to which we are in perpetual stress, and that's not to say stress is bad. Actually, stress can enhance your resilience. Kind of like if you're going to the gym, you, do, you, you put your muscles in stress to, to build them, right? I kind of look at things like meditation as, as going to the, you know, as my friend Light Watkins calls it, the inner gym, right? So, it's, so you're actually, you know, you can actually use stress to, to enhance and, and grow, but if you're in a state of acute stress perpetually, which, which many people are in our 24-7 uh, lives these days in modern society, that's one of the things that, that, that also has long-term consequences. Um, you know, diet, generally speaking, pro-inflammatory foods, sugars, sugar, uh, sh I'll just say, I'll, I'll say that a few times, sugar, sugar, sugar. Um, anyone who hasn't watched, watch uh, that sugar movie, um, really insightful resource. Um, sugar is in almost everything now. Um, and, you know, it's not to say that I, I have been able to totally eliminate it from my life uh, by any means, but being mindful of how much sugar you consume um, and also highly refined uh, carbs, white sugars, um, white carbs um, lead to spikes in the glycemic index. And th those have long-term consequences. So, uh, and then, and then as an aside, you know, to your point about my father, you know, my dad uh, drank diet soda and, and took Tums every night. Uh, uh, shouldn't probably name the na name brand. Let's just say he took antacids every night. And there, there is research that suggests the potentiality of, of things like antacid now given the new research into the gut, gut brain barrier and, um, and, you know, and, and some of the ingredients you'll find in things like sodas, uh, aspartame and the like, to have potentially, uh, you know, potentially harmful consequences. So, and also, we now live in a, in a it, this just happened, we now live in a world where there's now more obese people on the planet than non-obese people. So, if you're carrying uh, fat, um, that's, that's the kind of storehouse where a lot of these toxins can, can live. And I don't say that in a way, um, to make anyone feel guilty. <clears throat> I think there's far too much shame around weight. So none, none of my message is intended to be uh, shame inducing. And I'm, I'm by the way, far from perfect. Uh, it's just to say that, um, being cognizant of these factors is, is very important to taking your life and your health, um, on. And I think one of the main things we need to do is, is start to take responsibility. I mean, you know, a lot of us take more agency when we take our car into the mechanic or what type of fuel we put into our car, more so even than the degree to which we take our health or, or even our research when we go into the doctor into, you know, what we, what we put into our own bodies, or our own health markers. So it's okay. just a very call. <clears throat> okay. So, so some of the things here that we're doing to degrade our brain is poor sleep, um, eating, uh, having a poor diet, so processed foods like anything in a box, we're eating too much sugar. Um, you, you talked about grains and breads and carbs and pizza. So just as a, a little caveat here, I, I just completed the Whole30, which is, a, which is a program where you have to eat kind of flawlessly for 30 days um, and you eat kind of like as the, uh, the cavemen or the cavemen, cave women used to eat back in the day. So that means... Uh, very lean meats um, or farm raised um, eggs, uh, pasture raised eggs, um, and then fruits and vegetables, no rice, no pasta, no potatoes. You can have sweet potatoes, but kind of like doing like a pretty much like a, um, uh, a paleo ethic kind of diet. And I did it for 30 days. And at the end of 30 days, I felt terrific. Um, and then on the, on the, the last day, I actually had a, um, a pack of Oreos because I love Oreo cookies. And, um, and I had some uh, haagen ice cream and uh, it tasted bloody good. And I went to sleep that night and I don't want to put anyone off here over what I'm about to explain, but I, I, there's no other way to do it. 
I woke up the next morning and I'd been farting in the night. And <laughs> let me tell you, my room stunk like hell. It was awful. Just because, for 30 days, my farts were practically odorless, right? Odorless farts for 30 days as I'm eating this, this food flawlessly. And then as soon as I had Oreos and haagen ice cream, which is jam packed with sugar, something happened in my system where when I woke up the next morning, my room just like stank to, 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 to high hell. So that was a, a really good indication to me, like how bad eating like huge concentrations of sugar actually is. Something was going on in my system there. Um, that was kind of, uh, that was kind of nasty. And it was very noticeable because I'd eaten, you know, pretty much fall asleep for 30 days. And then all of a sudden, suddenly I'm, I'm eating crap food. So just a little side caveat there. Um, just, yeah, I'll, I'll say one thing about that. So I think mm -hmm. what you did in the context of, um, your diet, the 30 days ostensibly is, a, and I, and I know Dallas and I, I think highly of the, of the whole 30, um, mm. whole 30 diet. But what's, what I would say is what you're basically describing is you did an elimination diet, which I think is really wonderful. You know, there, there's no, I, I, you know, I don't think there's any one pill fits all or one diet fits all in healthcare. In, right. In my experience. Right. So right. I think for people to take on whatever that 30 day is to eliminate the things that when they find symptoms like that, right, where you, you don't feel right, you know, you maybe, you know, in, in your case, you you know, you're describing, um, you saw a clear shift after you ate a certain food. You know, I think listening to your body is crucial to taking ownership of your own health. Yeah. Um, just on that, I don't want to get into a whole like talking about, you know, paleo versus versus vegan and vegetarian and everything. But I think it's important to mention grains and breads there because bread is such part of our staple diet, right? And when you explain to people initially and say, you shouldn't be eating bread or maybe I shouldn't be saying it like that. Maybe I should say, have you ever considered eliminating bread from your diet and seeing, you know, how you feel? People are always like, what? I don't understand, but I have toast for breakfast and I need a sandwich at lunch and what do you mean I can't have rice? What are you talking about? Like rice is part of my diet. And then people point to like the Asian um, diet, which is filled with rice. And they say that, well, their health seems okay. So, so they've been eating rice their entire life. It's a staple of their diet. So if they if everything's okay with them, why does this, why should I give up rice? So can you just maybe just briefly, cause I want to move on to a couple of other things, clarify, why grains and breads and certain carbs can be so damaging to our brain. Yeah. So in essence, you know, uh, I won't go into, I won't go do a huge deep dive here, but in essence, you know, especially processed, you know, processed foods and grains, which are, which are often processed, you know, into the breads that we consume ostensibly, but not below the neck can, uh, you know, convert into sugar, uh, which has a whole myriad of cascading effects on our body, but basically, in essence, uh, promotes inflammation. And chronic inflammation is the source of many diseases, in inclusive of which is dementia. So, um, so, so, you know, I'm not going to go into don't eat, right, you know, I, you know, I lived in Sri Lanka for a period uh, where I ate extraordinarily fresh, clean food uh, with rice uh, and felt amazing. Um, so I think, you know, I'm not going to be the guy to be prescriptive in terms of saying that, never do that, you know, do that. But what I will say is in terms of uh, gluten, you know, there are a number of people that are highly sensitive to gluten and don't know it. For example, they, 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 they think that about 1% of the population in the U.S. alone has celiac disease. Celiac is an, extra, is an extreme uh, allergic reaction to wheat. The, con the consequence of which could be the uh, promotion of certain cancers as well as infertility. So I think you know, one of the things I would, I would argue is to either do a, an elimination diet and see how you feel when you remove things like, like wheat or rices from your diet, or, uh, and or um, doing tests. There are now a battery of tests that you can get for relatively cheap that actually will help you learn what are the ideal foods for your, uh, for your, for your genetic makeup, for your type, you know? So, so um, I put that out there. If you wanna have a, a whole list of things that I recommend as kind of an anti-Alzheimer's diet, which I'm happy to share, um, but, but I would say that to your point around. around. Mm. Now you're talking uh, about pesticides on produce. So um, if in doubt, try to get or try to go organic, I, I guess is the suggestion there. The other thing is um, the, the, the common bathroom 
is a chemical disaster in most households, in my opinion. In fact, I've gone through an exercise recently where, I've, where I, I almost eliminated every single chemical um, out, of my, out of my home. In fact, I had a, a cleaner come over to my, my, my home last week and uh, she, she criticized me, well, not criticized me, but she, she, said, she claimed that she couldn't clean my place effectively because I didn't have two products um, which were filled with chemicals because I basically replaced all of the chemical cleaning products with natural cleaning products and and her looking at this thing she was like oh i can't no puedo she was speaking spanish like i can't fix this i can't use this you need to go to the store and buy i think it was clorex and 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 tidex or something i can't remember what it was called but um in any case it it was astounding to me that someone didn't understand that i did not want chemicals in my home that I wanted purely natural products. So as an example, um, in, my, in my shower, I only use um, a product called Dr. Dr. Bronner's, um, which is all organic coconut oil and butter and things like that that you, that you use to wash your hair, to wash your body. Um, the hands, the hand, um, uh, hand cleaner that I use, um, I can't remember the name of it, but it's all natural products. There's a spray. Um, that you spray that kind of makes the, the bathrooms smell nice. It's all natural ingredients. There's no parabens. There's no chemicals. There's none of that nonsense. Um, uh, and, and I use Tom's um, deodorant. So when I'm putting deodorant underneath my armpits, I'm using Tom's, which again is, 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 is close to as all natural products you can get. I think there might be something slightly in there, but I'm not using like Axe and Gillette and all that kind of crap, which is filled with, with stuff. So, I've learned to ignore these commercials, like television commercials. You see like um, Neutrogena and uh, face moisturizer and like all these women like Jennifer Aniston and Hollywood movie stars who are peddling these face moisturizers and these shampoos. What they're essentially peddling is put chemicals all over your body. And Ben Greenfield, who's a friend of mine, has a podcast called Ben Greenfield Fitness. He's one of the most knowledgeable health experts I know. He said to me once in a, um, a phrase, and it really stuck with me. He said, never put on your skin what you wouldn't put on your mouth or w- never put on your skin what you wouldn't put in your mouth. Um, so I don't use those mainstream moisturizing companies anymore, you know, like Neutrogena and all this kind of stuff because they're filled with chemicals. Now I just put on extra virgin olive oil on my face or I'll use a company called Alatura, um, which is run by a friend of mine, Andy Nilo, who I've had on the show. And Alatura... Um, has all natural ingredients as well. So I use that as a face moisturizer. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess that plays into what you were talking about. There is like your environment and, and, and I would encourage you if you're watching or listening, just go and do a stock take of what, what's in your home. Look underneath the kitchen sink, look under the bathroom sink. What are you, what's the soap that you're putting on your body? If you use dove soap, chances are you're putting chemicals and parabens on, on your thing. What's the, what's the deodorant you use? What's the, what's the toothpaste that you use? What, what are you putting on your body? What's the, what's the, the aftershave that you're putting on your body? You, you're falling for this Johnny Depp inspired bull crap, bullshit marketing where it's like, you know, the, he's in a desert or whatever. And he's, I don't know what the brand is, but you know, like the, like the, um, the, the well, it's, it's really, I, I think, what I hear you saying is that it's not necessarily what important, what the importance of the brand is, but more, more to say, would you make a very uh, important point? The skin is the largest organ on the human body. Correct. And, and unfortunately we, we don't pay enough attention to the kinds of inputs that we, that we have in and around on or around our skin. Mm. Uh, and, 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 and the, and our skin is permeable. So in, in essence, what, what we put on or have around our skin um, winds up in our system. So Correct. To point, for example, around deodorants, um, you know, there's some research to, to, that links uh, uh, aluminum to Alzheimer's as a potential, as a potential causative, right? So, and mo- many, many antiperspirants um, have that as an ingredient, you know, um, people sometimes cook with aluminum foil. So, um, so it is important to be mindful, per, to, to your point, about what 
you have in your environment. And there's a whole nother kind of load that this generation is subject to in terms of potential toxins. And, you know, I, I'm personally not uh, uber extreme. I do think there's times in which, you know, if, if you have an acute uh, bacteria or virus in, in the environment, you know, like uh, bleach in an isolated area, uh, it can make sense. However, um, you know, there's fascinating research now, which to our, to our discussion around Alzheimer's, which actually is a graph I saw that was Dr. Perl Perl Perlmutter showed of the incidence of, of dementia and Alzheimer's. And almost all of the highest incidence countries are the most developed countries, countries like the United States, Iceland, Australia, uh, whereas the countries with the lowest incidence are often the developing countries uh, like uh, sub-Saharan Africa, etc., uh, which isn't necessarily a country, but regions, etc., um, certain parts of the Middle East, the lowest incidence of dementia. So there is a now research being done on how, for example, our, our, our sanitization or over-sanitization of our environments and, and, the, and the degree to which we use antibacterials and such, and that they may kill a lot of the healthy bacteria and microbes, which are fundamental to um, our overall health and, and, the, and the myriad of consequences that that can have on the body. You know, our gut, we have trillions of bacteria in our gut. You know, if we were, if we were to surround ourselves uh, and, and kill off all those bacteria, the, the consequences would be catastrophic. So the essence of what you're saying, which, which I would just piggyback off of, is we, we need to be very mindful of, of how, who's trying to influence what we put in or around our body and on our body because the skin is, is actually our, our largest organ. Yeah. Okay. So let's just move on just as we, um, we take this home. I, I kind of want to um, – well, actually, i got one question to do with the gut. You were talking about the gut. So – Besides trying to eat organic fruits and vegetables, free range meats, trying to lower our stress, being mindful of sugar, trying to get deep quality REM sleep, um, presumably you, you would also encourage the use of daily meditation, whether that's 10 or 15 minutes, um, improving the gut. There's a lot of products on the market there, you know, regarding probiotics, for example, take probiotic supplements. Um, I take a lot of um, sauerkraut because as I understand it, that can improve your gut health. But given that you said earlier that the gut is super respons is hugely responsible for our brain health, what besides you know good eating can we do to make sure that our gut is operating the way it should, knowing that ultimately that affects our brain? Yeah, great question. So I, I would I would encourage every one of your listeners if they haven't yet read the book Brain Maker to read it. Dr. David Perlmutter is one of the leading doctors in this field. He talks uh, quite a bit about, um, you know, the ways in which you can strengthen your gut health. So like what you mentioned, kimchi, fermented vegetables, kombuchas, those are things that are actually absolutely have uh, positive effects on the gut. Um, but I would also say that, um, you know, there's other things which are, which were not widely known, which are, are which are showing huge consequences on, on the formation of your microbiota and, and the flora in your gut. For example, um, and I was, I, uh, I was a cesarean birth, but natural birth, for example, has, uh, they, they, they believe, effects on the formation of your microbiome, as well as uh, breast milk. So th those, in, for the mothers out there, those, um, if you can healthfully deliver, um, they're, they're now doing swabbing, uh, for example, vaginal swabbing um, in babies that are born. That actually sets the, the proper foundation. And then, and then there are a lot of foods that we can consume throughout our lives to enhance the strength of the gut, um, such as the fermented foods you mentioned. Um, probiotics, I think it really comes down to absorption. I'm, I'm pro, I also take probiotics. Um, I think not all probiotics or all supplements are created equal, but I think that they're, um, they're very healthy. Um, I put together, uh, overall, I put together a list, if you want, of um, – which I'm happy to share with you of some of the things you can do to really kind of bolster your brain against Alzheimer's. Um, okay, go for it. Yeah, ra yeah. Rattle, rattle them through. And then I want to ask you one final question. All right, perfect. So just as a basic premise, um, you know, you want to avoid eating processed foods as we covered off earlier. Um, those especially sprayed with pesticides and fertilizer. Um, try to keep as much organic produce as possible. Um, read, read labels basically and toss out products that are, that are treated with sodium nitrate. 
um, that's not something you want a whole lot of in your body. Um, severely limit uh, your exposure to, uh, to, to white breads, white rices, to basically, you know, refined carbohydrates. Um, in terms of supplements, I like fish oils. Omega-3s are huge for your brain. Um, and getting good quality fish oils that don't have a ton of mercury. If you can do any heavy metal testing, a lot of us are exposed to molds and heavy metals like mercury. If you have those in your system, um, they can wreak havoc uh, down the line. So highly encourage any form of heavy metal testing and chelation if necessary. Um, vitamin, uh, high, high quality, uh, high dose B-complex vitamins, vitamin D, CoQ enzyme, uh, Q10, magnesium, all really powerful for the brain. In terms of uh, superfoods for the brain, blueberries are great, nuts, walnuts, uh, high fat foods. Keep in mind, your, your brain is 70% fat, so you want to be giving really healthy, high burning quality fuel to your brain in the form of great fats. And, um, and, and then there's, you know, neurotropics, ginkgo, there's things like ginkgo biloba and other things you can do for enhancing memory. And I'm happy if people want to come to, um, to peakmind.org, I can, I can send out, I've got a whole uh, list of things I've put together to augment brain health. Um, but, uh, but those are just a, a few recommendations in terms of a generalized approach to augmenting and strengthening the brain. Okay. Thank you. I uh, appreciate you sharing that. Now, what I want to what I want to read to you here is a quote, a famous quote from the Hollywood actor Keanu Reeves. And I have interviewed Keanu Reeves uh, on three occasions for when I was a film journalist. I got to interview him for when he was doing the promoting the Matrix movies. Uh, I can't remember what the other movies were. And then I sat next to him. Oh, sorry, I sat behind him. Um, in Park City, Utah recently at the Sundance Film Festival. I was at, a, at an event called Chef Dance and, and uh, he was sitting right behind me. And there's a very famous quote. If you Google Keanu Reeves' uh, message on living life to the fullest, and I want to read this to you. I don't know if you're aware of it, but it, it seems to be a somewhat counter argument to what you and other health experts are proposing here, which is living a life of being very, particular about what foods you eat and what you don't eat. So let me read the quote here. This is from the Hollywood actor Keanu Reeves, and it's his message on living life to the fullest. My friend's mum has eaten healthy all her life, never ever consumed alcohol or any bad food, exercised every day, very limber, very active, took all supplements suggested by her doctor, never went in the sun without sunscreen, and when she did, it was for as short a period as possible. So pretty much she protected her health with the utmost that anyone could. She is now 76 and has skin cancer, bone marrow cancer, and extreme osteoporosis. My friend's father eats bacon on top of bacon, butter on top of butter, fat on top of fat, never, and I mean never exercised, was out in the sun, burnt to a crisp every summer, he basically took the approach to live life to his fullest and not as others suggest. He is 81 and the doctors say his health is that of a young person. People, you cannot hide from your poison. It's out there and it will find you. So in the words of my friend's still living mother, quote, if I would have known my life would end this way, I would have lived it more to the fullest, enjoying everything I was told not to. None of us are getting out of here alive, so please stop treating yourself like an afterthought. Eat the delicious food, walk in the sunshine, jump in the ocean, say the truth that you're carrying in your heart like hidden treasure. Like hidden treasure. Be silly, be kind, be weird. There's no time for anything else. End quote. So that's a quote from Keanu Reeves. What are your thoughts on that as you, as you heard that? I actually think it's a, I think it's a cool quote. I mean, I think, I think what she's saying at the very end is actually the tenets of health. You know I mean? In, in my regard, in many regards, I think, you know, at the end of the day, joy, uh, Harvard just did the longest longitudinal study of its kind. And the single greatest determinant to long-term happiness is the quality of your relationships, you know? So, you know, we chose to do a deep dive because you, you asked me to focus on that vis-a-vis -vis the brain. But I, I think, uh, I think two things. One, I think I think what she's saying is is very powerful uh, in terms of I think quality of life, your joy, the amount you're laughing, um, your connection with other humans. That to me is the best medicine. Now that said, 
you know, some of the things she mentioned the other gentleman uh, uh, ate, like butters, fats, et cetera, is actually what you want to eat. And some of the things, <laughs> things she put on her, their skin, like sunscreens, which were probably chemical sunscreens, probably weren't ideal. That said, look, this isn't, I, I, I'm not personally, uh, this is me personally, I'm not personally uber extremist. But at the same time, I've learned the hard way that I'm going to have as much joy, as much fun, connect to as many people as possible. And yeah, I'll occasionally eat some ice cream. If my dad wants to eat ice cream right now because it brings him extreme joy, you better believe I'm going to take him for ice cream. I, do I think he should be eating ice cream every night? No. You know, so I think it's like, it's again, it's about taking your health on and like empowering yourself. And I feel like in essence, there's kind of the, the things that you can do to bolster to make sure you have as much time on the planet to enjoy those fun, expressive moments with people, with yourself, traveling, do all the things to light you up. And, and I can say, and, the, and I'll, I'll, bring, I'll bring you back with a quote, the Buddha said, of all wealth, health is greatest and best. And so if you want to live a truly wealthy life, take the biggest billionaire on the planet. If they were diagnosed uh, with cancer tomorrow, they would give it all up for their, to have their health back. So what, what, what brings you health, what brings you wealth in terms of your experience, I'm, I'm for. Well said. Michael Trainer from peakmind.org. Is that the best way we, we, can re, uh, we can connect with you, Michael? Yeah, you can reach out on peakmind.org, uh, michaeltrainer.com, and then I'm uh, at Michael Trainer across all the social platforms. And Trainer is uh, T-R-A-I-N-E-R. Correct. Michael, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. I'm sure I speak for all of our listeners when we wish you and your father the best of luck in his uh, dementia journey. And, uh, and uh, we appreciate you sharing your, your story with us and, uh, and uh, you know, expressing vulnerability and talking about that. We really do appreciate it. Thank you, James. Uh, it was an honor.